So as Adam said, I'm Trevor Landau. I work at the New York Times. I'm on the uh, mobile team there. Um, and I'm here to talk to you today about test-driven backbone development. I also want to thank Boku and sponsors for giving me this opportunity to speak here. Uh, it's my first time speaking. It's really exciting. Ah, so I'm just going to give you a little background on uh, what we're going to be talking about. Um, let's imagine we have a brand new app. Your boss sits down with you and says, hey, this is what we're going to build. So you start building the project. And you write code, and then you test the browser to see if it's working. And sure, it's working the first time you check it out. Continue to build the project, checking the browser, not working. So you see where the code is failing, you go fix the code. It's still not working, you go back and fix the code. All right, so let's fast forward a few months, and uh, project's ready, go in development, or production rather, and everything's going well. So after this, a couple months go by, and a lot of users are using the site, and suddenly they want these new features. And your boss comes to you and says, 90% of our users are asking for this brand new feature. I need you to implement it. Um, let's get it in now. So a lot of work is done on, let's say, a backbone model. So you make a change to your model, and then you load up the app, and you realize it's not working anymore. So you check out your code, and you say, this looks all right. Still not working. And then you look through your stack trace in your dev console. And you step through and say, oh, OK, we need the problems here. It's all right. This is a real problem. So you're like, what? What is going on? I have no idea what is breaking here. <laughs> we can get around this. We can fix this, or mostly fix it anyway, uh, through testing. So what exactly is TDD? So TDD is Test Driven Development, and it's a direct quote from Wiki, a software development process. Um, the idea is to write our tests, followed by writing code, and then we refactor. Here's a basic workflow chart. Um, in more detail, we can write our test um, for a specific unit. Um, so let's imagine we have a backbone model that we're testing. And we create our model, and that's all we have. So now we go to write our test, and we can say, this model should be doing this thing, this should be doing this thing, and et cetera. Once we have that in place, we can run our tests, and they should all be failing because we haven't written any code yet. After that, we write the minimal amount of code to get, this te to get, these, <laughs> to get these tests passing. Once they're passing, we actually want to go back and refactor the code and make it work better. So why TDD? Kind of explained it already. However, it sounds like coding is going to take a lot longer. But at least we can balance this out because you're going to spend a lot of time debugging code that is not tested. TDD forces you to understand the problem before you actually solve it. It also encourages smaller units of code. If you find yourself writing large functions, it's going to be difficult to test because it does so many things. And this, in turn, reduces debugging efforts. Code becomes easier to understand also because of the, how you write your tests. So it's, in a way, self-documenting. So how do we TDD? You want to begin by employing a test runner. The test runner provides functionality for allowing you to write and add tests. These functions have specific verbiage to write the tests. Um, there is a behavior-driven development, or BDD, a way to write the tests that I prefer to use because of the readability. In JavaScript, there's a ton of frameworks. Uh, most popular ones are Mocha, Jasmine, Qnit. Probably all heard of these. Um, so how do we get started writing a test? Some test suites come with assertion libraries. Assertion libraries is where we actually test if a uh, return value from some function is working. Um, and some require you to include yourself. Of course, you could always write your own. Here is a basic assert function. This expects a Boolean value and some sort of error string that will get outputted. If the Boolean value is not true, then we simply throw an error. And uh, you can even use this in your code, and it, it's actually quite useful instead of actually saying, if some value, then throw an error. Um, so to give some credit to Todo MVC, uh, it has popularity. So a lot of people know what it looks like because when they jumped in the backbone, uh, this is where they went, most likely, if they've done it recently anyway. Um, and it's small and easy to understand. While it does not work for a large-scale app, that is true. Um, so it seemed like a great place to 
do some testing. And so I've written uh, tests for the backbone uh, to do MPC app. Um, as I mentioned before, there's some frameworks. Uh, I'd like to use Mocha. Um, this allows you to use TDD or BDD Burbage, but uh, just as a reminder, I'll be discussing the BDD Burbage <coughs> style. So, um, as I said before, we get a set of functions that's employed by the, or that's uh, provided by the test runner. And the first one is describe. Describe is a basic function that accepts a string and a function. We don't have to worry about functionality under the hood. Um, the first bit is describing what exactly we are testing. So in this case, uh, we're testing a to-do model. And we just say to-do model, and that is it. But you don't necessarily always want your assertions described in one block. So we can actually nest our describes, uh, and this is really useful for readability in terms of we have a to-do view, and I'm testing the initialized method. Uh, the, the way I prefer to do it is do usually do a dot to represent that it's a method of this uh, class and not a class instance uh, or a class static method or something. Um, but these can actually be nested infinitely, but best, best practice says you should probably not go two or three levels deep and you get like that callback hell look, but uh, it's a little more straightforward. So um, the next function is before, after. <laughs> um, but the purpose of these functions is to prevent code from bleeding into another test. So let's imagine you have uh, a large data set that you're trying to test your code against. One of the tests may actually modify this data, but it needs to be set back to its original state for the next test. So within before each, you're, gonna, you're actually going to create the data there, so that, that way it's reset every time. It's also an excellent place, but frequently executed code for each test. Uh, imagine you have a collection, um, which we'll actually see next. So we have a, our describe of our to-do list. And before each of our tests, we want to set uh, an instance, I guess an instance test variable, uh, to co uh, create a new collection. This way, for each of my tests, I don't actually have to go back and say new app to-do list, new app to-do list, I can just reference this dot collection. Let's look, actually look at a more complicated example. So here we are um, in describing two views. This is actually um, an upper piece of the code and then the lower bit. So in the this is uh, one before each, which will go for the entire test uh, suite of the to-do view. And we create a model and a view that uses said model. Then down below, in a nested describe, we test the close method for it. So if you look at the to-do MVC um, to-do view, its render, or rather its close method, requires the input instance variable to be ready for you. So in order for that to be ready, the view must be rendered. But we don't want to call view render for every test that we're running on close. So instead, in the before each, it, this will just run for the close tests. We'll call render on the view. Now, where the real work of the tests actually occur is in it. Sorry, no picture. It was not easy to find one. Um, all assertions should live with inside these functions. So let's look at an example. Please notice that I'm only testing the tag name in this specific test for this view. We only care that it's going to be an LI. If there's something else that's, uh, or if there's another view, <laughs> Um, that sets it differently, it's actually going to break this test. It won't work. Um, also notice that the, how I've um, written the it syntax, I have it very readable, in a re very readable fashion. It says it should be a list tag. This is how your test should read when you actually see the output um, when you run your test running. Um, so we set the assertion that, um, basically like a function I wrote before, we say tag name should equal li, and this will pass if it is in fact that. Um, we can actually make this more readable using chai.js, which is a test library. It provides an API to help you write tests in a more readable fashion, and also gives you um, more functions to help you test more easily. So we can look at the exact same test we saw before. It should be a list tag, except we're going to use chai's expect verbiage where we can say it should be a list tag and expect the tag name to equal an li. 
In the second example, we have it should be set completed to false by default, and we expect this dot model completed to be false, as we have just created a blank model for this one. Let's take a look at one more complicated example. We have uh, the next order method. I actually discovered a bug here uh, in Todo MVC because I ran tests on it. Um, in the first one, we should return one if the length is zero. And so first, we want to test to make ensure that the collection is actually of length zero. And then we'll test the method for sure. In the second one, I actually had to set order to one by default. Uh, you test this method on its own. Otherwise, it does break. I think it says nan or something. So uh, bonus points to whoever goes and fixes that to do MVC. Um, so this is all good and well, but we want to be able to test more. And with basic assertions, we can't test everything. However, SignInJS gives us a lot of more ways to test uh, our code. Because we want to be able to test codes that, we want to be able to test code that, uh, such that a method calls another method. Um, for instance, if we call save on backbone, we know that sync is called under the hood. <coughs> um, and per perhaps we have uh, some code that we want some pre-programmed output. output. Sign, in pro sign in provides spy stubs and mocks, which allow us to do this. First, we have spies. A spy captures state information, such as arguments passed to a function, return values, and uh, actually has a lot of things on it. A uh, common use of spies is to test the method you used inside the unit other test that was called. Let's take a look at that. So here I'm testing the comparator method. Please note that I'm not actually testing backbone, what backbone does with comparator under the hood, just that it does something that I'm expecting. So if you look at the to-do MVC code, we'll actually see inside its comparator method for the collection, it calls uh, get and order on, on that model. So we create a to-do model, we create a spy and we spy on get. So this will actually, the spy is almost equivalent, it's just basically a wrapper around get with all these extra bits that I talked about before. And then we call the comparator method with said to do. Then we can check against the spy and assert against that it was called once and it was called exactly with the order string. And this will pass in. Now you know that your comparator will always be working as you expect it to. If you do find a bug with a comparator, of course, file it back though. Um, so here's a more advanced spy usage. So we're looking at the initialize method. And we create a spy for on the view, and it's listened to. So we're expecting every time we initialize a view that we're going to be looking at three different event buffers. One is for uh, the change, destroy, and visible. And we can always ensure that we're doing this. Be aware that you are testing in three different units here, not all of them at once. Uh, so a, a good purpose of these is it enforces implementation details as well. Next we have stubs. Uh, stubs are functions with pre-programmed behavior, but they also support that full spy API. So if you want to use a stub, you can also say it was called once or called with certain arguments as well. Um, a, good, a good reasoning to use this is because you want to prevent a specific method from being called. Um, maybe it does something like an AJAX request. And through our tests, we don't want to be testing our AJAX requests. We actually just want to simulate them because we want to be able to say, I have good data for this test, and I have bad data for this test, because we want both of those to work. So here's an example of a stub. And this is the toggle completed method from the view. So we simply create a stub on the model, and because we, we don't care about what the actual toggle behavior is doing. We just want it to go away. Because maybe it's going to the server, we don't know. We know that we're going to use it within that call, but we don't want it to actually do anything. So all we do is ensure that it was called in this, in this work here. And we couldn't do this with a basic assertion, only with uh, sign in can. Here's another example of toggle visible, um, except this time we're passing a third parameter to the stub we actually return a Boolean value. So is hidden method actually has some more complicated logic where it does uh, other get calls and whatnot, but we don't care. We just want to know that it's returning true in this case. So we create the stub. In this case, we also have a spy on the element for toggle class. 
and we're just overriding this method. We're not actually going to use any of it, other, and use it at all except for that case. So we call the toggle visible method, and we expect the call to call exactly with the hidden string, and that the value was true. Let's look at one more example for stubs. Um, in this case, uh, I actually had to create an enter key constant that um, to do MVC uses. Um, but I, I reset it each time. Um, so this is actually testing a, which is normally a DOM event or a click event. But we don't really need that. We can just give the event what it expects, which is just using uh, the which property from the event object. So we can call that and just uh, expect our stub to be called once uh, for the first one. And notice in the last one that if it doesn't receive the right key, uh, it, we don't want it to be called. So uh, chai gives you the not operator, which will just flip the, um, the assertion value to the other way. Uh, last, we have mocks. Um, some people would argue that these are fairly similar to stubs and maybe use mostly use stubs instead. Uh, in fact, the example I'm going to show does not um, give true justice to it because um, to do MVC just doesn't have a good place for it. Um, so a reason to use a mock is because you want to state your expectations up front. And by that I mean, if we look at the previous example, we're checking the stub last first. Um, to, or we're asserting the stub last. As opposed to using a mock, which we can actually state it up before. And we'll look at that in a moment. Um, directly from the sign in website, the rule of thumb is, is if you wouldn't add an assertion from some call specific, don't mock it. Use a stub instead. And generally should never have more than one mock in a single test. So let's see it in action. So in this case, I'm just uh, um, creating a mock on the to-do model, and we're expecting on the sync operation. So the toggle method actually calls save. So it, this didn't really work too well, so you can't really set a mock for that. Um, but, so let's just ignore that fact. So don't normally test a backbone thing here. Um, so we can actually go into our, the, the assertion here and say, we expect this to only be called once, no less or no more. And we call our method, and then we verify set mock. And uh, I think this is a good way to help organize your tests because you say exactly what you're expecting up front, followed by a, the simple model call, and then we verify that it did in fact work or not. And if it doesn't work, it will throw an error and you'll know in your tests. So, let's actually run the test. Since we're working with Backbone, um, I imagine most people here do on the front end. And all these tests I wrote for 2MBC, so they're on the front end as well. Uh, so if you navigate to your browser, uh, to the URL where you have included all your files, we can actually get the full test run suite. This is just a screenshot uh, portion of it. Um, and uh, an advantage to running these tests in the browser is also being able to run it on all the browsers, such as Internet Explorer and its slew of versions. So we can make sure that things like if we're using function.bind is implemented on 6, 7, and I think 8 is missing as well. Um, but we can also drill into these tests. So we can click onto this. This is actually only the to-do model one. Uh, it will actually grep for that file. and. Uh, just show those tests that you care about. Um, you can actually get all the full readings from it, including the code that you've written for it. However, when your tests are passing, it's not terribly useful, but it's incredibly useful when your tests are failing. So in this case, we were expecting it to be, fal uh, to be false, but it wasn't that true. So we can dig into this by clicking on the assertion error itself, and it drops down what the code is there. And in this case, it was expecting to be true even though my bit statement says it should be false. But we can go beyond this even, and we can automate this. And we can do that using Grunt.js. Uh, if no one's used Grunt.js before, it's basically a task runner in which you can do many, many things, um, like testing, uh, templating files, or what have you. You can do basically do anything. Um, so, this is a basic setup for it um, using the Grunt Mocha plugin. Uh, the website is actually quite good on this. 
and it's pretty easy to get going. You simply set a source, and you have some options you can set. Um, notice I have bail true, uh, bail set to true, and this means that if any any of my tests fail, the first ones that come across are just going to immediately stop. So you actually don't have to worry about it when your test suite grows to 500 tests or so. So this is what the actual output looks like. Um, as we saw before, we had 36 tests. And here again, we saw 36 tests. It's just the important information uh, instead of actually digging into it. So if you do need to go further into it, I would run it in the browser. But otherwise, just run it in, the, run it in your terminal. And in fact, you can um, configure run to watch your files. And anytime those files change, it'll automatically run your tests so you know if something breaks right away. It's really great. Uh, and so here's what it looks like when I, one actually fails. I'm not sure why it says one of NAM, maybe because it's the first test. Um, again, bonus points for anyone who fixes that. Um, but here we see, again, the exact same output we saw in the browser, which was the to-do model should be set completed to false by default. We expect the false to be true. And we get one of 36 tests failed because it stopped immediately. Um, beyond that, which is great for teams and community projects, is continuous integration. So we can actually make use of Grunt, uh, put continuous integration in, and every time someone makes uh, a, a commit to the GitHub, for instance, uh, your continuous integration server will actually pull in your code and run your tests and make sure they work. <coughs> um, this is especially useful for projects like Backbone, where people make pull requests and break everything. Um, so continue, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, before I go on, um, Travis CI is uh, highly used on GitHub, and uh, that's the one I think that people go with for the most part. Um, but Jenkins uh, is another one that uh, I believe Node.js uses, uh, uh, is also open source and free. So back to this. Uh, so what not to test? Um, I touched on it before, we shouldn't be testing third party code. For instance, we should not be testing Backbone. We shouldn't be testing jQuery. Um, and this all rolls up into network calls. We don't care about the server. We don't want to test the server's output. We want to know exactly what's coming back. Uh, it's going to the database. We want some consistent data. So there also are disadvantages to testing. As I mentioned earlier, it does take extra time. And boss might not want to do that, so but you can convince him and, or her, and you can say, if I do all these tests, when we come down the line and the project gets very large, if I make any changes, I might break something. As I mentioned before, you can just easily write tests and you can see where everything breaks down the line. Now one thing you might not be able to get around is maintenance overhead. If you make any changes to your code, you're going to have to go around and fix all your tests. If it's something big, a huge refactoring, all your tests will also have to be updated. <coughs> also, there's blind spots that can occur. So the same person who's writing your test is also writing your code. So if they miss, uh, let's say there's an assertion on uh, the number, is the, a number is supposed to be the type of the first parameter that comes into a method. If that's skipped, it's also going to be missed in the test. You can get around this with a good code review, and uh, GitHub's interface is really good for that. Uh, and I'm sure that's mostly caught by there. But can I always TDD? It's not always easy, especially if you're into a new realm of something you haven't done before. You can't just start writing tests on something you don't know what you're doing, uh, especially if you're prototyping. Um, frequently, that prototypes have terrible code because you're just trying things out, and code changes frequently, and you don't have time to spend on it. So. Don't always enforce on yourself or feel like you're doing something bad if you're not doing TDD. <laughs> and beyond unit testing, there's integration testing as well, which uh, will take components and see how they interact with each other. So you can actually run tests uh, in the browser itself, and you can simulate real clicks and see that a real modal pops up, for instance. I don't have anything to show on that. Um, it's, it's too much to go into. but. I definitely highly advise going to look into integration testing after your unit tests are written. Um, that's pretty much it. Questions? Questions? Oh, hey.
I'm just curious, uh, you're using um, Mocha Chai and uh, Sun On. Um, have you, is there any reason why you would recommend that combination of tools as opposed to Jasmine, which has all of those? Uh, yeah, the what I actually discussed earlier with someone this morning was the fact that when you need to test something asynchronous, Jasmine is a huge failure. It is like a set of three different functions and Boolean flags or some sort of count. Uh, it's really quite a pain. Uh, to do on VC didn't really have a good opportunity for anything asynchronous. Um, but by simply passing a, a done parameter to your it statement, or even before each and after each, um, uh, that automatically makes it asynchronous. So um, imagine you write it, and the first parameter into it, the function is done, and that's a function that gets injected into it uh, through function two string. And at the end of your test, when asynchronous things are done, you can just call uh, call that function. And call done. You can even pass errors to it, and if there's an error that occurs, it will call an error on and break your test. Um, so this could be useful if you have events firing, maybe on a view. Um, so you can do uh, this dot model on change, and when that change actually occurs, just call done with it. So uh, yeah, you said we shouldn't test the server, which is true. So normally I just take a snapshot of the data and then test against that. But what happens if you know the the server people are having a fun night and they change the API, um, and your tests still pass, but then there's no server output. So are you are you, have you done anything like along the lines of like automatically generating that snapshot data every so often, or some way of keeping that sample data in date? Um, personally, I haven't had that problem. Um, all my data has been pretty. <laughs> but uh, it's a good point. That's the same just made. Um, integration tests could help with this. You'll know your code will just break because your app won't work. Because um, that's when the real data will come in. So you'll just get a nice surprise, I guess. Um, but there's nothing like uh, you could always set up run to do that sort of thing. Um, however, you know it's local to people's machines, so maybe you make that a task with people's warnings. Say, hey, run this, and make sure you get the most up-to-date fixtures of some sort, um, and yell at your backend guys. We're not telling. <laughs> uh, so, sort of a follow-up question: um, What do you do? You uh, recommend any code coverage tools, and are there any tools that you've seen that are focused on integration testing in, like, a Node Phantom environment? Okay. Um. So, you had like two questions, sort of, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to think of one, and I lost track of the other one. So, uh, the first. What was the first one again? Sorry. Uh, code coverage. Code coverage. Um, I've used JS coverage before. Uh, just runs your tests. I think that's by the same Vision Media guys. Um, it's a pretty nice output, actually. Um, I haven't come across any bugs for that. Uh, and in terms for integration testing, I've mostly played with. Um, a lot of people have used Selenium. Obviously, is a really popular one. Um, but also coming out of Angular JS was uh, testacular, but now Karma. Um, <laughs> it's now Karma, which actually they have a lot of work. They there's bundles uh, with Jasmine for Angular, but you, it's totally independent of that, and you can run Mocha in there. And I, I'd give that a try. And it's actually just a bare test runner in general, so you can uh, have even run your unit tests. Um, but they the Angular. We'll give, I'll talk to you later about that. If you want to catch me? I can't remember the exact name of the library that they have, uh, but it's actually built directly into Angular, and you can actually run like click events and stuff through that. But it's independent of Angular even though it's on Angular. Uh, any suggestion on the assertion libraries that can check DOM manipulations, uh, <coughs> compare DOM elements? Um, be more specific? Uh, well, you uh, made a distinction between integration test and uh, unit testing, but in a lot of cases, your JavaScript code is specifically geared to modifying DOM and basically nothing else. So you actually want to run it in the browser and check that the expected DOM that you receive equals to what you expect. Um, so basically checking all the DOM nodes and so on. Okay. Um, so that's, that is a part of integration testing. And again, that Angular bit or Selenium uh, is a good way to test those sort of things in practice. 
What uh, grunt tasks do you run with uh, Mocha? What NPM packages do you recommend? Um, so, grunt Mocha is the one I typically use. Um, I've used, I don't, I didn't use it in this project. But I also used a grunt template, and that allowed me to generate my test file dynamically. So if I add a new spec file, uh, it's automatically put into it for me when I run my tests. Um, that's really handy rather than adding it yourself. Um, and on a project at work, we actually are running the coffee script, and I run my tests the same way, except I'm running um, uh, using Grunt Connect, which just makes a Connect server for you, and you can just pass in your middleware there. So this way, I actually generate my coffee script files on the fly, and I don't have to worry about running them in the browser or anything. Uh, I kind of wanted to respond to two other questions, actually. Uh, one question was about um, integration tests, and Sign on, I don't know if you use it, has like a server component, so you can like fake out the server, it'll swap out X XHR, so you can send back fake data or bad data, or just whatever you need. And somebody asked about DOM manipulation, and ChaiJS has it, if you're using jQuery, has a jQuery plugin that'll test like the DOM, make sure like classes are set and con text is changed to different content and stuff like that, so. That's oh, that's useful. Um, yeah, I've used the XHR one for sign on before. Um, I find that most of the time I just need to like, stub the data and I just return some fixture anyway. But the XHR one works well um, and even works for JCP. Yeah, there's this is just a, another response on the integration testing because we we have we use the exact same tools uh, at Coursera so as Mocha Kai sign on, but then we also use JS DOM. And JS DOM fakes the DOM, which means you can do really fast DOM tests. So I consider unit tests to actually include our DOM because it's like a cool function. The DOM changes like it just you know it's a unit some sort of different unit test, but it runs really fast. So we've got like 500 tests that test the DOM in two minutes, which is a lot faster than you could do for Selenium, yeah. right? I've heard disagreements about JS DOM because it's not actually a real DOM. It's not a real browser, and it obviously does not go across all the browsers you might need to test. Um, so that's, um, that is a good solution, um, but it's not like the full blown way to do it. And the nice part about Backbone is you can actually render views in memory, uh, so you can actually unit test them as I showed before with the event. I don't actually care what the DOM is doing, I can just render right in memory and test it that way. Um, something that's gaining a lot of advocation is uh, uh, the functional testing approach, uh, which is testing the consequences of a uh, series of functions or series of behaviors. Um, as opposed to testing atomic uh, units of logic uh, within JavaScript um, is something that we're actually trying to implement right now. Well, we have a hybrid approach, um, it, but it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense in both cases. There's a lot of things that functional testing doesn't apply to, and a lot of things that unit testing doesn't apply to. You seem to be pretty uh, directly geared toward unit testing. Why is that? Like, I, I mean, do you feel like there is a place for functional testing or not? Um, I don't have too much experience with functional testing, so I can't really weigh against that. Um, but unit testing is just like the basics of what your uh, application is doing, what your modules are doing. And you can really boil down to exactly what's going on uh, through that. Um, that. That's why I really <coughs> like unit tests. I, I try to write as many as possible. Uh, sign in definitely lets you write a ton more than you could. But you don't have the opinion that uh, unit tests represent the entirety of logic that needs to be tested, or? Uh, well, not in, any, not in any case that it always needs to be like the entirety. Like it really is the entirety, but it doesn't have like the interaction between um, integration testing, right? Uh, especially when you go to different browsers. I'm not sure of that. Maybe we can talk after. I'd like to elaborate on that. Uh, so I have one last slide. No. Has any more questions? Um, I have uh, a repo out for this. You know, improve the test if you can, or if you need to practice, you know, delete all of my assertions that I have in there and rewrite them until they pass. It's a good way to get practice in. Oh, and also, if you have any um, reason to try CoffeeScript, testing is a really good place to do it because there's not a whole lot of um, new syntax you actually have to use. It's basically some skinny arrows and some functions. Um, I, I recommend doing that. And it's actually a lot easier to read as well because it's so streamlined down uh, with you know, a few indentations. Uh, it's really nice to read your code without all the clutter. Uh, same with run tasks. I recommend CoffeeScript for that too. That's it.